uh, our next panel, let's let me invite them up and and uh, we'll get uh, we'll get cracking on this. Uh, I'd like this to uh, this panel is dealing with a a sweeping variety of issues, including the th three things I mentioned this morning that we don't. Hi, Arnie. Um, th we don't talk about enough, which is uh, markets, trade, labor. Uh, we're going to uh, talk about cyber as well this morning. This is a, a little bit of a of a potpourri, but um, uh, I think uh, I think this is going to be a, a fabulous uh, panel. Um, let me just start uh, introducing them while they're getting seated. Um, uh, a lot of you know Rob Graham. Like he 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 was the uh, he was the uh, 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 oversaw transmission policy for the American Wind Energy Association uh, for uh, for uh, about 12 years, uh, having just left there to found something called Grid Strategies. Uh, and uh, uh, this is uh, 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 one of those indicators that says uh, transmission is, uh, mm -hmm. is the coming thing. So, you know, they're well-qualified well intellectuals uh, going into, uh, into this area, and, and we're delighted to have Rob here. He, he was um, economic advisor to Pat Wood, uh, one of my successors at, uh, at the FERC. Uh, he worked with Pat for, for four years. Uh, he was chief economist uh, at the PJM Interconnection. Uh, he was uh, a, a senior associate at PG&E National Energy Group um, and, uh, and worked at uh, FERC's Office of Economic Policy before that and ICF. Uh, uh, Rob has really been around the block and I think that uh, I personally have benefited uh, many times from his from his insight and his energy. So I'm, I'm delighted that he's here. He'll co kick off this conversation by talking a little bit about the implications of renewable energy for transmission. Uh, Arnie Quinn, uh, I was delighted to see as a fellow Badger. He is uh, he's from, uh, uh, got his BA from, or BS from the University of Wisconsin and a PhD from Minnesota. Um, he is currently the director of the Office of Energy Policy and innovation at FERC. Uh, those of you who watched the two-day technical conference on uh, on the, the bulk power market uh, will recognize Arnie as uh, one of the uh, leading uh, policy uh, lights at at the commission. And uh, I'm sure his life is going to be very interesting and very busy uh, when uh, when our uh, 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 friends across the street approved two new commissioners and and the FERC gets back into the business of uh, of uh, of doing business so um, uh, uh, Arnie is going to going to uh, talk a little bit about transmission and uh, the bulk power market um, Caitlin Durkovich you may recommend r recognize her right, Caitlin she flew in from uh, someplace uh, 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 last night or this morning <laughs> and, and Caitlin, uh, w you may recall if you were here two years ago and we did something similar in this location, uh, was uh, a at that time Assistant Secretary for Infrastructure Protection at the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, she is now with uh, uh, the leadership team at Toffler Associates. Some of you may remember Alvin Toffler, you know, the, the guy who uh, understood the future better than anybody. So I, I think that uh, I think that she will have some uh, uh, great insight. She's uh, uh, going to focus on uh, fiscal and cyber risk management uh, issues uh, with regard to 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 the grid. She's a graduate of uh, uh, Duke University uh, and uh, has spent a lot of time with the folks at the Aspen Institute. Dan Prouse uh, comes to us from Manitoba, Manitoba Hydro, as a matter of fact. He's a professional engineer uh, at Manitoba Hydro, which uh, I'm pleased to say is also a WIRES member. Um, he has uh, a lot of experience in nuclear reactor safety uh, and just to change things up, uh, a little hydro operational optimization, uh, uh, export power sales and transmission access. Um, I think mastering any one of those would have been 
uh, would have been uh, above my pay grade, but he is, uh, he is a really great source of, of information, insight. Um, Dan's been a design engineer. He's been a project manager, uh, provided operational support. Um, and uh, so we rely on him a lot for information about the Canadian market and, and, uh, and uh, how uh, the cross-border trade uh, is going to affect our grid and vice versa. Um, uh, he has a wealth of international experience and, um, and is, uh, I guess his position currently is Director of Sy uh, Transmission Systems Operation at Manitoba Hydro. Uh, our last uh, speaker, uh, uh, um, uh, Tyler Eaton, uh, is, uh, it comes to us from the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, that he is uh, that he is going to uh, uh, talk a little bit about labor this morning, labor issues, uh, and those are it's one of the areas we don't spend enough time on. Uh, Wires did a report; it's now unfortunately f five or six years old. Uh, I believe the Brattle Group did it, as a matter of fact, and and uh, uh, talking about how many jobs would be produced directly. And, and uh, indirectly by construction of transmission at the level we think it's going to be needed. And the numbers are really quite startling. Uh, at the time we did that report, uh, the U.S. economy was struggling to produce 20 or 30,000 jobs a month. And, uh, and uh, this report uh, said that uh, we could, just by building transmission, produce um, many times that, perhaps as many as 150 or 200,000 jobs a year for 20 years. Uh, uh, so transmission infrastructure is a is a, an area of economic development and employment that uh, that we that we shouldn't ignore. Um, uh, Tyler's going to introduce uh, uh, a, a video uh, on uh, uh, the economic impacts of a single project. Um, um, uh, we picked one, and uh, it, it's it's very informative. A little ten or eleven minutes, and I think you'll I think you'll enjoy that. Did I get everybody? Um, okay. Um, thank you very much. I'm going to let Rob Gramlich lead off, and um, and hopefully we'll have time for questions at the end. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Ten or twelve minutes. Hmm? Ten or twelve minutes. Yeah. I forget. Thanks, Jim. I appreciate it. It's uh, great to be here. Nobody gives an introduction like Jim Hecker. Uh, I've been very pleased to work with WIRES over the years. I was there at the, at the founding, helping recruit uh, participation in the original creation of WIRES. I felt like we really needed a, a strong voice just for transmission, uh, and that, that's what we've had since WIRES was created. So I really have always appreciated being a partner. We, when I was uh, with AWEA for, for 12 years, transmission was always recognized as the biggest long-term challenge for the wind industry. Uh, and I'm just back. I took a red eye and uh, shuttled over here uh, from the Wind Power Conference. I say that in part to uh, uh, give a caveat and excuse if I lose my train of thought <laughs> from my fatigue, but also to say at the Wind Power Conference, the annual uh, event, the grid was everywhere. Everybody's talking about the grid as the, the number one challenge. Uh, and uh, that is, I would say, in addition to the better operational use of the existing wires. I look forward to the smart wires presentation later. Uh, I've recently become a big fan of dynamic line ratings, which uh, uh, just a, a quick diversion when the wind's blowing, you're producing a lot of wind output. You're also uh, cooling the lines at the exact same time so you can physically deliver more uh, at those very times. And yet the system doesn't allow for that uh, uh, delivery because we use static rating. So that's one example. We got to use the grid a lot better to deliver clean energy. But uh, if I can get my picture here of the grid that you've already seen, um, that's just who uh, my new effort is. Uh, you've, you've seen this map. The purple area is the uh, wind resource. We just have a vast, very low cost resource here. And it's not just um, the macro scale in terms of the middle of the country with population centers on the coast, but also within areas like within California, within New York. Uh, there's a great upstate New York resource and obviously a downstate load. Uh, and within most regions, that same dynamic occurs. So there's really no alternative in the long term to more infrastructure, expanding the grid. That, that just really has to be part of the agenda. Uh, I want to uh, 
uh, without repeating everything that uh, Jim said on behalf of Wires and what uh, Judy in particular said for Brattle, uh, all of those enablers, I think, are uh, benefits of, of transmission, uh, resilience, reliability, reducing congestion, uh, and, um, uh, and access in clean energy. So uh, clean energy access is just one of those um, benefits that the grid uh, enables. Um, but uh, I think an important one. Uh, and there's, there's not just a, a geographic component to it, i.e. moving remote resources to, um, to population centers, but there's an operational aspect that uh, there's been a little discussion of. If you think about variable resources uh, that are uh, not uh, operating at the same time, the, the output is not coincident. It's, uh, 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 not correlated with each other, the wind's blowing uh, somewhere else if it's not blowing here, uh, then what you really need to do is move the power around. Uh, same is true for solar. We're seeing in California certainly this, this spring, uh, they really need to move some of that uh, zero, if not negative priced power uh, around the west uh, if they're going to integrate more and do it in a cost effective way. We've had some success in grid expansion. I think the last 10 years we uh, did change the discussion a little bit and change some of the policies. Uh, you see the, uh, these are all new lines here uh, on the map uh, working from the uh, top. There was the MISO multi-value projects where they took uh, a whole bunch of the benefits of transmission, rolled it up together and put together plans. The benefits exceeded the costs uh, in the modeling. <clears throat> and by the way, ex post, the benefits have been uh, two to three times the cost. Uh, and then moving down to the central plains there, the Southwest Power Pool, highway byway lines, very similar effort. I think they're all finding that they wish they had done the higher voltage version of those lines, uh, but uh, those have been economic and valuable nonetheless. Uh, and then Texas, uh, the uh, well-known competitive renewable energy zone uh, plans uh, that is uh, delivering a lot of wind from um, northern and western Texas. And to blow that one up a little bit, in this picture you can see the, the wind resource bubbles there that were connected. Uh, turns out uh, the Permian Basin gas uh, uh, drilling has relied on these same transmission lines as well, which is one indication that you build transmission, you end up using it for a lot of reasons that you, you might not have originally thought of. And sometimes the power even flows in other directions from what you planned on. So it creates that optionality uh, and uh, multiple values over time. So how, how did we do that? Uh, you know, there was a question about infrastructure, how, you know, how do we pay for it? Is there enough money out there? Um, the main way we've done it so far is in the uh, wholesale transmission regulatory world, i.e. Uh, FERC, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, uh, policies and tariffs. Um, there was a uh, chairman of FERC uh, around 2000 who did this thing called Order 2000. So Jim instituted these new things called regional transmission organizations uh, and they put together, they basically started a regional planning process with importantly a tariff to link it up to. We had had regional transmission groups before but there was no tariff to put the costs into. So now uh, with MISO and SPP um, we had uh, a tariff so you could do the regional plan, you could see if the costs uh, or the benefits exceed the cost. Uh, and then uh, once you did that, you could uh, agree and negotiate within the region on a cost allocation mechanism, i.e. which, uh, which load serving entities paid how much uh, of that cost uh, based on the modeling of who benefits by how much. So it was roughly a beneficiary pays, um, but it was a regulatory beneficiary pays, not a voluntary um, uh, type of approach as in other industries. This is a, still a natural monopoly that's a, a regulated sector. Uh, so, uh, but we did that, FERC did that, uh, MISO and our, uh, SPP filed those with FERC, FERC approved, uh, it get, got paid for and all those lines got built and they've been extremely beneficial. That whole process was easier in Texas when you have one state, all the you know, winners and losers are, are within one state boundary. It was much more difficult in the SPP and MISO context where you have multiple states fighting over, well, my ratepayers don't benefit as much as yours, so you should pay more. So that continues to be a challenge in the interstate context, uh, but at least we know it can be done and we did increase annual transmission investment a fair amount, which uh, basically allowed for the wind boom that we've had. We really would not have nearly as much 
of this 70 plus gigawatt uh, wind resource operating now uh, if we had not uh, built all this transmission. Uh, are we done? No, we're not done. There's still a lot of congestion out there. I'm actually not the only person today using this slide, uh, but this is a heat map of congestion. The purple and blue are very low electricity prices. The uh, orange is, are higher prices, and you can just see this is, uh, this is not like annual average, but this is a point in time. Uh, this is a frequent occurrence in the Midwest. Basically, from the central towards the east, you get higher prices, and that indicates costly congestion that could be reduced and benefit uh, consumers, as well as access the clean energy that a lot of these states want uh, if you built that transmission. This is uh, a, a set of plans from one Department of Energy study. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see it in much detail, but the point is a lot of lines uh, were shown uh, to be uh, beneficial uh, across that same geogra geographic area. Uh, <clears throat> everything I've described is sort of the regional AC uh, alternating current uh, uh, grid network uh, types of lines where, um, you know, with AC lines you can't really regulate who gets on and off. Uh, you, you can't uh, cut, cut customers off. It's all pooled electrons together. Uh, and so it's really much more of a regulated environment uh, in the RTO tariff uh, is the only way really to do that. Um, more recently, there's been uh, a, a lot of development in the uh, direct current um, DC area. These can be more merchant or sort of voluntary market-based uh, types of lines. Uh, there's a bunch of them around the country, Clean Line Pattern, LS Power, uh, and Barrick. Uh, ITC has a Lake Erie line. There's a lot of line, uh, TransWest. There's a lot of these lines around the country. The economics of DC has, has become, uh, I think, more widely, uh, just better and more widely recognized and understood. Uh, moreover, you know, it's easier if you, can, if you can get the customers to sign up for capacity, then that's a lot easier than trying to get 15 states to agree on something. So um, that creates some market for that. They're permitted in, in similar ways. And um, uh, yeah, let me get to the next slide to talk about permitting. Uh, the, the permitting um, of all of these lines uh, is generally state by state or um, uh, more uh, localities uh, that have to permit the lines. Uh, and that's, that gets me into uh, some of the policy framework and policy discussions I think we need to have to have a uh, transmission supportive policy environment. Um, we really have nothing like the natural gas industry where there's uh, federal siting of pipelines. Um, and, uh, you know, we're never going to get that. Uh, but uh, there, there could be ways we could move towards that in extreme cases where states uh, disagree uh, about a line and uh, there could be some federal involvement to help with the permitting uh, in that. Uh, uh, there are some authorities at DOE that were passed after the blackout of 03 in the EPACT 05. Uh, act that provides some federal backstop siting for DOE. Only one of those uh, authorities was ever used just once. Um, so those 1221 and 1222, happy to talk more after about those, but these, those could be used more and better uh, than, they, than they have been. Uh, and then a lot of lines end up crossing some federal land or another. Uh, so interagency coordination and uh, implementation of the, the FAST Act uh, could be useful there. Certainly the Trump administration's focus on infrastructure and speeding up permitting could be uh, used to uh, great effect in the transmission space. Uh, so we're, we're hopeful that we'll see some of that. Moving to uh, FERC and the regulatory agenda, we have, as Jim and others have said, two, uh, at least two new commissioners coming on over there. We are hopeful that they will put into, uh, uh, you know, continue or expand a pro-infrastructure agenda there, and that would involve more of this proactive economic planning. So uh, instead of what uh, still happens all too often, where the transmission planners only do anything if it's uh, a line is strictly needed for reliability and you violate a reliability criterion, uh, there's a lot more economically uh, beneficial transmission out there if they would proactively look where the resource is going, 
look at what states are trying to procure in terms of often remote renewable resources, uh, and uh, you know, so do it on a proactive basis and consider all of the economic benefits, not just the reliability benefits. So uh, that is squarely within FERC's uh, authority and role, and uh, we hope they pursue that on the planning side. And then on the cost allocation side, as I said before, some form of broad beneficiary pays uh, type of approach that goes into the tariff, uh, that would be very helpful. And that only covers the intra-regional transmission. That's what we've done fairly well at with the lines I talked about before. Pretty much nothing has happened in the inter-regional area. So between MISO SPP, MISO PJM, um, and then, you know, out in the West, uh, just any kind of uh, uh, regional transmission coordination out there would be better than what we've got. So uh, we hope uh, the, the new commissioners uh, put a focus on inter-regional transmission. And then finally, um, oh, and well, one other thing on FERC, I mentioned uh, uh, grid operations, dynamic line ratings, you're going to hear more from smart wires, but I, some form of incentives, I would say, for transmission delivery or throughput. You could say incentives for innovation, uh, that's fine too, but I, I think even just making it more performance based, instead of a transmission owner only making money on their invested capital just because they, they built a capital asset and threw it in rate base, uh, if there were more incentives to take some of these lines and get an incentive so there's something in it for the transmission owner to deliver more power, that would be very helpful. I think we'd see some of these technologies deployed. I think we'd see more clean energy delivery if we did that. Uh, so then turning to finally to uh, an incentive, I think it's generally, the narrative is generally true that transmission is uh, privately financed. There's not a great need for uh, a whole lot of uh, federal money in an infrastructure bill. Uh, but I, I, would, I would suggest if you think about the discussion earlier with Judy about uh, whether there's sort of enough money, yeah, there's enough money, uh, and yeah, in theory, the, you know, regulatory uh, you know, world could uh, take care of uh, lines that are economically beneficial over the long term, but the fact is they're they're not for the higher voltage long term lines uh, that would be uh, of of great benefit. Uh, there's basically you can kind of get some of the lower voltage lines paid for. People can kind of agree to pay a little bit here, a little bit there, uh, but really what's efficient in the long term is to upsize these lines or right size these lines for the long term. Uh, just like Judy said, plan over the 20 or 30 time, uh, year time horizon. You know where these resources are. They're not moving, uh, so you have a high degree of certainty these lines will be used and useful. Um, but we don't. We we have a big gap. So if there is some kind of fund federal funding to sort of pay a share of a reservation on some of these lines, and then it gets paid back over time as users come on, uh, I think that would be of great benefit to taxpayers uh, and electricity users. So I will uh, end with that um, and look forward to the discussion. Thanks. Thank you. Well, good morning, and Jim, thanks for the invitation. Um, I'll turn to step back a little bit and talk about um, how transmission and transmission planning fits into the bulk power markets overall. Um, and I'll do a little bit of a retrospective on how the thinking has evolved on how that interaction has worked or is going to work. Um, I think very broadly, um, there, there had been prior to centralized organized markets when there were just vertically integrated utilities this um, sense that vertically integrated utilities would do integrated resource planning. It felt like a nice um, closed system. The, the utility could, could um, compare transmission investments versus generation investments. Um, and that is a system that, that had its pros and cons, but doesn't translate particularly well into organized markets. Um, but I think you'll see themes as I talk about how our thinking has evolved, how, how those general ideas maybe start to reappear a little bit. Um, Going all the way back to um, when uh, organized markets were um, invented, I think one of the, the key breakthroughs um, in developing organized markets um, was the importance that transmission um, played in um, helping us understand the value and the costs of serving a broad footprint. Um, so at the very beginning, there was kind of a debate about whether you should vary granularly in a very detailed way model the transmission system um, or whether you could do that on a, a, a more higher level way and kind of manage uh, transmission constraints kind of on the fly 
um, kind of this debate between zonal, um, that's kind of the higher level, or nodal markets. And I think the big breakthrough was that um, the transmission system is complicated enough and important enough that costs of producing electricity um, can go down a lot if you do very detailed modeling of the transmission system and really account for those transmission constraints on a very detailed way. Um, and I think that's become fairly close to a consensus view, at least in the United States. Not so much in Europe, but certainly in the United States. Um, so once you've appreciated how important it is to understand what the transmission system is doing, you then do this very detailed modeling and then you get very detailed prices out of that. And you see very locationally specific prices and you get these heat maps like the one that Rob put up, um, where you can see areas where you've got high prices and low prices. That breakthrough, I think, one, is, is important just for making sure you've got the lowest cost set of resources producing at any one time. Um, and uh, Texas did a study when they moved from zonal to nodal uh, to show the, just the huge cost savings on a production cost basis of moving to that system. The other benefit you, you should get out of that, though, is highlighting areas where transmission would be beneficial, um, investment in transmission would be beneficial. And I think our idea initially was that People would look at that heat map, like Rob put up, and say, ah, there's, a, there's an opportunity there in upper Wisconsin to connect Minnesota to northern Wisconsin, and I, as a merchant transmission developer, will go find a way to exploit that opportunity. Um, that, that, I think, was our idea when we started these markets in the 1990s and the early 2000s. Um, the tough part of that model um, is that creating the line destroys the value. Um, so the moment the line is there and you collapse the prices, there, there is no price difference. And if someone was trying to grab the, the difference in value between those two locations, that difference in value stops existing. So you've got to find another framework for, for capturing that value. Um, so we haven't actually seen um, much, or if any, investment from the merchant side on inter or within region uh, transmission. We have seen a little bit between areas. Um, uh, where we've seen it is places like um, New England to New York or um, Canada to New York, Canada to New England, out, connecting outside to inside the U.S. or to U.S. regions. There's been a couple examples where merchant lines have been able to kind of capture the value of differences between market areas. Um, and there's been a couple very specific geographic places like San Francisco Bay where merchant lines have been successful. Um, but kind of appreciating that this merchant model for capturing value within a market based on locational prices wasn't working as well as it could have, the commission um, has and market areas have started to use the transmission planning process um, to play that role. Um, so the commission did something uh, a few years ago called Order 1000. Um, it was designed to provide both a ex-ante or before the fact cost allocation method and a planning process that someone who uh, gets a resource that is uh, selected through that planning process can use that cost allocation method to get paid. Um, and th that starts to feel like a, p a possibility for addressing these economic projects. Um, because it's planned, because the, the capturing the value really then goes to convincing consumers who are going to ultimately pay for the line that they're getting some value from the line and you're allowing the, the transmission developer to put something in rate base. Um, that, that's the idea. Uh, these transmission planning processes have existed for a long time. I think, as Rob said, the, the main role has been to address reliability problems. It's typically not hard to convince, and in fact, often the, the market operator or the transmission planner um, has no problem saying, listen, if I don't build that transmission line, there's, I'm going to violate a reliability standard. We're not allowed to violate reliability standards. We have to build something. So the only question is what are we building, not whether or not. Um, on economic projects, there's a little whether or not um, question. Um, Order 1000 is a little early. It's, not, it's been going for a couple years. Um, most of the market areas or the transmission planning regions have done something. It's, it's fair to say um, some of them have done less than others. Um, so we have a little bit of experience um, in what's happening right now. What we can say is 
Some of the transmission planning regions um, have consciously chosen not to distinguish between reliability and economic projects. Um, I think that's something Rob pointed out. That's something that I think you just you keep an eye on to see whether that's um, a useful thing in terms of allowing a full set of benefits to be brought to the table to justify a project, or if that becomes a way to just not address the economic problems. Um, some of the other areas that uh, directly do address economic projects in the planning process um, have done so, but we haven't. We just at this point haven't seen many. I think um, as I was coming here, I asked our staff. I think we knew of off the top of our head one project that has gotten, one economic project that has gotten through the transmission planning process um, that Order 1000 established. So I think there is potentially more work that can be done there. The commission held a conference last June to talk about this whole process and to identify areas um, where that process can be improved. Um, it was a pretty expansive tech conference. We talked for two days. We asked a bunch of questions. We, we ultimately identified five high level areas. Um, the, the fun part and the, the frustrating part of FERC is um, all of those areas get into the esoterica of the Federal Power Act and transmission planning and market design really fast. Um, so all of the things are little things. They're, none of them are huge things. They're, they're enhancing transparency or they're um, modeling beneficiaries a little better. Um, but that's something that, uh, as a number of people have noted, we're waiting for a full commission to, to get on board so we can start to talk about whether that, that fits into the priorities of the next commission. Um, the last thing I wanted to say was um, that that transmission planning process, in addition to identifying uh, reliability projects and identifying economic projects, also can identify uh, public policy projects, projects that are designed to address public policies for the states that are involved. Um, the, uh, the bubbles that Rob put up for um, the middle of the country, SPP and MISO, um, those would probably fit into the bucket of public policy projects. Um, they, I think the interesting thing about the public policy projects is the places that have had success have been able to do it because they can bundle a bunch of projects together and get a portfolio of things that everyone feels pretty comfortable. Um, it provides sort of a grand bargain of benefits and costs. Um, and uh, I think it's, it's telling that the grand bargain was successful. And I think something that we keep our eye on going forward is whether you can do discrete individual projects one by one through this process, or whether you ultimately do have to get to the point where you've got a grand bargain of multiple portfolio sets of projects to kind of get the process to work. Um, and that would be tough. Um, I think because uh, a lot of the areas have told us when, when we look at why there hasn't been more activity uh, in the planning process that they had just gotten done doing a lot of work. ISO New England says and, and points to a lot of investment in transmission as a reason they haven't done things. Um, Mid-continent ISO points to those multi-value projects as being the reason they're not doing more things going forward. Um, if, those, if there's a basis for any of that, um, in fact, then that means that we're not going to get eight or nine projects coming out of a transmission planning process to, to get to a grand bargain. Um, and so we've got to be able to do these things one by one. Um, uh, and with that, I'll, I'll the next person go. Uh, good morning, everyone. And Jim, thank you very much for inviting me back. Um, Rob, I thought. Uh, I had it bad uh, coming from Milwaukee, connecting through Chicago and getting in last night at uh, 12. But if you've caught a red eye, then I have no excuse and uh, cannot stumble. You did very well. Um, I am uh, really very delighted uh, to be here, uh, in part um, because I firmly believe um, that the grid, uh, and in fact all critical infrastructure, is a strategic asset. Uh, and in fact, I spent um, the last eight years of my life working at the Department of Homeland Security um, in partnership with owners and operators of critical infrastructure uh, to manage this increasingly um, complex risk environment uh, that, we are, that we are living in. Uh, and that included uh, with owners and operators of the grid, of our water systems, of our transportation, transportation systems, um, the list goes on. And I will tell you over the course um, of those eight years, uh, the risk matrix 
uh, that we used evolved. Um, it, it started uh, early on uh, in the days of the stand-up of the Office of Infrastructure Protection focused largely on natural hazards and threats of terrorism. And by the time uh, I left the department, and if you look at the matrix we use now where um, you have likelihood, uh, uh, increasing likelihood on the x-axis or probability on the x-axis and materiality and consequence on the y-axis, um, the number of uh, existential threats that you now find on that uh, axis has grown, and it includes, or that matrix has grown, and it includes uh, everything from um, denial of service attacks to coordinated cyber attacks to EMP to space weather, uh, and the list goes on. And so much of, of what we did in the Department of Homeland Security, and it's certainly what I'm uh, doing in, in this next chapter of my life, um, was work with owners and operators to help them understand these risks, to think about the consequences, um, to understand uh, where we had gaps, uh, what the roles and responsibilities of, were of industry and what of government, really at the end of the day, to, to better manage this risk. And, um, there are, when you, when you take an issue, for example, like cybersecurity, a number of um, kind of strategies that we talk about about how you can protect the grid. Um, but at the end of the day, we would keep coming back to this very basic notion that we have to start to um, do security by design and that we are at a very important part uh, or at a very important time in our country as we start to modernize uh, our infrastructure, and whether that's our transportation infrastructure, our electrical infrastructure, our water infrastructure, that we have to put um, the coders uh, and the, or the security people next to the coders, uh, the builders, and the architects. And um, it struck me as I was talking um, to Jim and others involved in this wires effort, and certainly looking at the presentations uh, here today, um, that the um, absence of security in this conversation is something that we have to change. Uh, that as we think about integrating um, renewables, all of these um, amazing technologies, this concept of prosumerism, uh, that we have to make sure that we are talking about security um, at the same time. When you think about this modernized grid, um, certainly the complexity of the physical layers are going to increase. Um, we are uh, building a grid that is highly dependent on uh, communications. And so we already live in this complex, interconnected, interdependent world where disruption in one sector can have cascading impacts across uh, multiple sectors. We have to start to think about what does it mean as we um, continue to build uh, reliance on all of these sensors and all these communications to increase efficiency, to increase control what that means for the congestion of the communications network and the ultimate reliability of the grid uh, itself. Um, certainly, we are, we are building a grid that is geared towards performance and efficiency, again, uh, monitoring and sensing all the time. And uh, the integration of all of this distributed technology, how are we thinking um, about the security and uh, the resilience of this um, amazing, what is already an amazing engineering feat. And so as we start to think about um, this next generation of the grid, uh, really what, what I argue is that, that security has to come hand in hand with all of that. And so I think that begins as we um, think about this infrastructure bill, that part of, part of that bill um, has to be inclusive of security and resilience. We have to make sure that as we modernize it, as we fund these investments, we are tying it to, make, to ensuring that we are building in um, security, that as we evolve um, and we look at the lifespan, lifespan of infrastructure, uh, that we also account for the evolution and the adaptability of that infrastructure to evolve with a changing um, climate, with changing threats, uh, and that we recognize that the, that lifespan is going to be 100, 100 years long. We have to think about the supply chain. Uh, this is something that uh, increasingly we are concerned about in today's grid and where we um, procure the, the, all of the different technology that makes up um, this complex ecosystem. Where is it coming from? What do we know about the provenance of it? What, what does the fact that we may be buying some of these products, software, hardware, um, from countries like Russia, China, and others. 
uh, what window does it give uh, it, does it give them into how we run our networks? Um, who owns um, some of these resources? We did um, a lot of work in my time at the department um, with Australia, and increasingly they were seeing parts of their energy system um, bought up uh, not only by the Chinese but controlled on uh, the mainland of China. Uh, which created a rather uh, existential threat for them. And so this is something that we need to consider as we think uh, about the policy. How do we create a framework um, with the public utility commissions, with state and locals, with um, all of the stakeholders who make up this grid, uh, really to think about, uh, again, the security of this very complex enterprise and not leave it in the hands of individual owners and operators and users. Again, bake that security in from the beginning. Um, equally uh, uh, challenging, and I'm, I'm very interested in Tyler's comments, is uh, the workforce uh, concept. What we know now is that we have an aging uh, workforce in many of our utilities. They are at the retirement age, and when you look at um, the availability of the workforce uh, to some of these utilities, especially with an increasingly technology-driven and modernized grid, um, you don't have really the, the transfer of knowledge that we need um, to understand how the current grid, current utilities works and to be able to transition that into a modern grid. And that has a lot of implications really at the end of the day for resilience. When you think about um, this very electrified, digitized environment that we've built, uh, and if you have a disruption, the ability for a human being um, to know where that crank is, to know where the box is, to be able to press that button, we have to make sure that we don't engineer that out of, the, out of our systems and that we've got a workforce that's available to be, uh, to be that backup. Uh, and at the end of the day, how we ensure that we, as we, again, create this, this distributed network, that we're not increasing the attack service and that we're creating that tax service. So what's that? Um, that partnership that we build uh, to think about that. So um, I end with as we drive towards uh, a modernized grid, as we think about all of these distributed um, technologies, resources uh, that can lead to a more uh, re reliable and resilient grid, that security has to be part of that. So thank you very much. Good morning. I'm uh, Dan, Dan Prost from Manitoba. Judy started off by, uh, or in her talk, mentioned that Canadian Hydro can play a, play a role in the U.S. grid, and that's quite true. Um, it's more than 1,000 miles from our gen hydro generating plant on the, on the left up there to, um, to Minneapolis. It's more than 1,000 miles from some of Hydro Quebec's generating plants to New York. But in spite of those differences, in 2014, Canadian Electricity provided 11% of the load in Minnesota and North Dakota. It provided 12 to 16% of the retail sales in New York and New England. 30 states are deal with Canada on electricity supply. And the major purchasers are in Michigan, California, Oregon, Washington, Montana, and Vermont. Jim showed you a slide about what the grid looked like mid last century. And it doesn't it didn't look um, the way that it the way that it does now. At the beginning of the, my career, there were essentially no significant grid infrastructure across our international borders. In the 1970s, we built international connections because we had cheap surplus energy. Either US or Canada were building large generating plants and we wanted to improve reliability. By the 1980s, we had large interconnections like our 500 kV line down to Minneapolis. At that time, bulk commodity exchange made sense. Canadian generators helped to meet peak U.S. load in summer. U.S. generators helped to meet Canadian winter peak load. But over the decades, things changed. We moved to an impressive level of coordinated operation. We have levels of reliability and economic efficiency that were just impossible in the past and impossible without cross-border trade. I would have told you a decade ago 
that what the current operation is not technically possible. You can't have that many smart people. You can't have that much infrastructure. And you can't have computers that are that fast. Now we are at, uh, the state that we are at is that if the Midwest has a sudden surplus or deficiency in wind generation, energy is pushed into energy storage in Manitoba or it's pulled out of energy storage in Manitoba within five minutes. And while our eastern and uh, mid provinces, mid continent provinces, are net exporters of energy to the US, in the west our western provinces are net importers. In electrical energy, Canada is both a customer and a supplier to the US. Now trade prospers when there's a competitive advantage. The Canadian and US generation portfolios have developed to reflect their natural advantages. The US is well positioned to take advantage of low cost gas and increasingly wind. Canadian generation supply is largely hydro. It's clean, it's very reliable, it's very fast moving, and is often integrated with large amounts of energy storage that inherently exist. Cross-border trade makes good sense. We share our surpluses, we help each other out in shortages, and we provide related services that each of us is better positioned to provide cheaply, like energy storage. Reliability is enhanced when there's diversity, and this has been mentioned several times. It's no longer inconceivable that there'd be malware that would affect the control systems of a large number of gas turbines or nuclear plants or wind farms. There could be price or supply dis disruptions in fuels, natural disasters, geopolitical barriers. Those can all separate you from your generation or separate you from critical spare parts. We stand together in emergencies. 20 years ago, U.S. generation saved Manitoba from blacking out. You supplied energy when we were in the midst of a wind event that isolated a lot of our generation. Ten years ago, we returned the favor. In September 2007, our fast responding hydro generation was key to saving Northwest MISO from blackout. Our initial and most critical response occurred within two seconds. We moved to 1,000 megawatts of generation to halt a frequency excursion. Now, most of you are experienced in the industry, but if, if you're not, uh, just understand that. 1,000 megawatts is like the energy of a million horses. It's like 100,000 cars driving down the highway, and all of a sudden, you start to go down the steepest hill you've ever seen. Well, you start to take off, and you need a massive break. And what we had to do was essentially bring 100,000 cars to a halt within two seconds in order to keep the system from speeding up and shutting down to keep it from breaking apart. This is a slide often seen. Canadian Hydros has typically provided uh, cheap economical energy and it just happened to be renewable. The U.S. trend towards renewable energy is basically coupled with the need for energy independence and there's been large investments in these wind resources. Now wind power avail availability becomes, uh, becomes important when you start to look at, at new resources. And this is a graph of load over 30 days at Bonneville Power and it shows you that when the generation mix includes large quantities of wind, which is the, the blue lines there, it, the average is smooth, the, the heavy blue line in the middle. But it can be anywhere from zero and maximum. And similarly, solar in general has a very predictable pattern. But at any moment, it can almost be anywhere from maximum to zero. So you need a large amounts of energy storage to deal with this. And although there are new technologies, keep in mind what's ch proven to be reliable and, and cheap. 99% of the energy storage in the world is stored in water. The sun drives everything, whether you capture it directly because, it's, uh, because you're capturing the energy, or it moves the air and you capture it, or it moves the water and you capture it. Each, each of those steps slows down the, vari slows down the variability. MISO is called the Manitoba Hydro System, a supersized pump storage plant. 
So grid transmission and cross-border trade provides U.S. grid operators with more supply options, including energy storage. Operation of the grid is challenging. Supply and demand is changing constantly, and just as a stalled car or a minor accident can cause havoc in your transportation system, problems on the power system can be disruptive if not resolved immediately. And if you're interested in some details on energy storage, uh, I participated in the webinars done by the Midwest Governors Association, and you can look up some of the discussion there. MISO has been very effective in calculating the cheapest way to serve load and identifying borders to providing least cost supply and addressing the short and long term barriers, uh, remedies to those, to those barriers. One of MISO's initiatives was to study in a very detailed way how Canadian hydropower could serve MISO's customers at the lowest cost while dealing with the challenges of wind power integration. Now it showed, that study, that the benefit of additional cross-border trade, which would result from a new transmission line and new Canadian hydro generation, in, could benefit U.S. customers by between half a billion and a billion dollars a year, depending how you measure the savings. And Judy's slide uh, number 44 there shows the Great, uh, Great Northern Transmission Line, which is what, something I've been working on for more than 10 years. So this study is an example of how, if, how an effective grid and an innovative grid operator can permit low-cost Canadian hydropower to deliver energy, provide energy storage, and fast-acting response. Facilitating border, cross-border trade is a special case of eliminating artificial hurdles. MISO studies its value proposition to, and to illustrate that regulatory and technology, technology change can free up the unrealized value in the grid infrastructure and facilitate rational future investment. Much of the $2 billion benefit that MISO claims comes from permitting existing generators to more effectively serve load. This is accomplished by a variety of changes from reducing tariffs, hurdles, administrative barriers to trade, and by coordinated grid planning and by operations that reduce physical barriers to trade. So over the decades, we've moved from a bulk commodity exchange to a highly integrated level of uh, new levels of efficiency and reliability. Can and U.S. bring different energy sources together in products? And we have shared interests, whether it's national security, rational investment, reliability, or jobs. We are each other's customers and suppliers, and in certain regions, Canadian power is uh, an important supplier of, of low-cost energy. We work together on the issues that Caitlin was describing, whether we're designing electrical infrastructure or we're worried about cybersecurity, whether the future involves carbon capture and storage or not, but Canadians are making a major investment in that, and we, we, we share our knowledge. Cross-border trade is important. It's mutually beneficial. We're reliable partners. We're trusted partners. And when you build on that trust, you can make invest long-term investments, and you can make the policy and process decisions that move us forward. That's how the grid becomes more reliable, more affordable, safe, and secure. So our experience has been throughout the U.S. And, and across borders, that when, when we eliminate, eliminate barriers, we reduce costs, we improve reliability, and we improve price certainty. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, before I do show you the video, I just want to say if anybody out there, the, the video is, uh, have, was done actually by a, one of our contractors, Ellie Myers. Uh, this is in no shape, way, or form uh, me up here trying to sell their services, but the story that comes out of the video has helped uh, other utilities that are looking to get uh, projects uh, going, such as Northern Pass and a few other ones. So I'll let you watch the video and then I'll speak some about uh, what it's done for us and the utilities that I've been working with.
In February 2011, the first truckload of poles arrived at Ellie Meyer's newly established construction yard in Palmyra, Maine. After months of planning, crews were eager to begin work on the four-year construction project, which would add some 2,100 jobs per year and more than a billion dollars in spending to Maine's economy. The largest energy infrastructure project in the Pine Tree State's history, the Maine Power Reliability Program was an investment that would ensure the continued reliability of Maine's 40-year-old bulk power system and increase access to the state's growing renewable energy resources. Established in 1891, the Ellie Myers Company is the oldest of the MYR Group subsidiaries. Over the years, the company has established a reputation for ingenuity. In fact, it was Ellie Myers who first deployed helicopters to set lattice structures and built this country's first 345 kV transmission line in the 1950s. <laughs> Nearly 60 years later, Ellie Myers was awarded the largest portion of the MPRP, the Northern Loop where it would build and rebuild more than 1,000 structures and 210 miles of 345 kV and 115 kV transmission lines spanning the evergreen forests, rugged mountains, and sparkling rivers of northeastern Maine. It's a huge project for what it means to the state of Maine, not just from the electrical side, but in the economic side as well. As the line turns, we'll be putting in... And who better to work on the project than the folks who live here? I'm one of many lucky people from the state of Maine to have been able to work on this project. A lot of uh, our team are from Maine. The scale of this project's required uh, just an enormous amount of folks and uh, you know we've had to take people that weren't in the trade, bring them into the trade, give them the training they needed through the local apprenticeship programs and we've really given a, a lot of folks an opportunity to work in a, a very good field and make pretty good money. I'm working my way through this apprenticeship program thanks to Ellie Myers. I definitely notice they like to hire as many local people from the area as they can. The area includes not only Maine, but other New England states as well. Yeah, there's a lot of local people here on this project. It's always nice to see the company try to keep local employees, you know. So I'd like to stay as close to New Hampshire, Maine, Vermont as I can. Tom McCosh is from Burley, New Hampshire. He came to the MPRP from IBEW Local 104's Apprenticeship Training Center in the Granite State. Yeah, I'm pretty excited to get on this job. It's, uh, it's only about two hours from my house, which is actually the closest I've ever been. The Northeast Apprenticeship Training Program has been really fantastic to work with. We've worked with at least 150 apprentices on this project that have come through our doors. It's a great place for a young apprentice to come and gain this kind of experience. He'll be able to pin that, you see what I mean? You got good teachers here. There's a bunch of people that's willing to teach. I mean, that's the thing. They're going to learn more on this job than they are in a lot of places. One of the few videos you're going to see out there. And most important, they learn how to work safely. During our orientation process, that's one of the things that's really stressed is that everyone is empowered to stop the work if it's not right. We've got plenty of the big hooks, we've got positioning lanyards, we've got retractables. Uh, they appreciate the tools we give them, the safety equipment, the fact that we give them time to do it right. I really think uh, they appreciate that. We recently achieved a million work hours uh, on the project without a lost time incident. We're extremely proud of that. And it's a commitment, number one, to safety, but it's also a commitment to doing the right thing for everybody. All I ever wanted to be was a farmer. <laughs> yeah. Gary Williams is the community relations specialist for the project. He's a friendly face who answers questions and solves problems for local residents and town officials. And Gary and I, over the, the project, you know, we were able to build a relationship of, of trust with one another. Uh, and I, I consider that relationship was nothing but positive. Any complaints that were, were brought forward by residents and so forth were handled expeditiously. And, you know, they got right onto it. And uh, so it made my job much easier. Especially at the last two weeks before closing. We Danielle Flanagan and her husband bought their home in Clinton, knowing line crews would be using their driveway to access the right of way. And not knowing what to expect, we were, we were scared. Particularly because the crews would sometimes be working at night. The crew was very courteous. They tried to face the lights as far from the house as possible, which was nice for our sleep schedule. And even pulling down into the driveway, they'd turn their headlights off so that they weren't shining into our windows at night. 
that meant so much, especially as first time home buyers. We could still have a home and not be part of this active construction site. Were you happy with the project? Yeah, were you very happy? <laughs> Morrill resident David Simmons also had nothing but good things to say after leasing his field to Ellie Myers for helicopter landings. It was in a strategic spot for him and uh, it seemed like it would work out all right so we, I agreed to, uh, to let him use it. But when they left there was no evidence of them even being here in uh, the field, you wouldn't even know it. Pristine when they when they landed and pristine when they left. That makes me feel good to know that that our, our footprint is almost non-existent, and that that makes me feel like like I've done my job, and, and the company has has fulfilled their commitment. I hired another one today. As a Mainer himself, environmental coordinator Chris Lavasser shares that commitment to preserve and protect the state's natural resources. So we're all doing our part to make sure that we leave our state in a condition that we're happy with. And that we're working for a company that, that supports that. Maine's climate and landscape, while beautiful, can also present some major challenges. The four seasons in the state of Maine, along with the, the very difficult terrain that we have to deal with, this is a very tough project. One of the toughest tasks on the project was site preparation for four 370-foot tall lattice towers, which were assembled along the rocky banks of the Penobscot River. Blowing through tons of ledge to make way for the towers required the local knowledge and expertise of crews from Maine Drilling and Blasting, who have worked steadily for Ellie Myers throughout the project. We've had five, sometimes ten guys on their line at one time throughout the last couple years, which has been a huge deal for, for us in Maine. Large or small, steel, wood, or concrete, Ellie Myers' quality assurance supervisor is there to see the crews are doing the right things the right way. But if a bolt is sticking out half an inch longer than it's supposed to, then he lets the general foreman or the foreman know. You know, we build the line the way it's supposed to be built. They know our quality is there. And I think that's true with our subcontractors that we've hired. Subcontractors such as Lawcom, based in Viana, Maine, who performed all of the fiber optic splicing and testing for the project. Our, our fleet department, MYR our fleet has supported us in every way. It takes an awful lot of equipment. It takes a, a lot of good equipment. Of all the remote sites we have, uh, you got to have dependable equipment. So they have a lot of nice stuff to work with. When you need something, they buy it, and it's not junk. And that's really helpful for us to be out here working in it. Also really helpful are the hundreds of Ellie Myers workers who are out there powering up the local economy, giving new energy to Maine's small businesses. Oh, it's been a huge pickup, especially in the morning business with the coffee and the breakfasts and stuff. And the guys have been great. We saw a big influx at lunchtime. Uh, you know, you'd see anywhere from 10 to 20 different guys come through. It was good. It was good for business. It's good for the whole state. Well, absolutely. The dealership uptown, people renting homes, the young fellow that went in the snow plowing business in town. Yeah, it's made a big, big difference. Yeah, that's going to be a hard call. Gary Beam is a farmer who supplied Ellie Myers with more than 60,000 bales of hay and straw. It's helped me get a lot of back bills paid up because, you know, the economy hasn't been that good and stuff, and it, it has helped in that respect. I paid everything off, so I'm set in a lot better position than I was. Steve Clisham's construction company supplied Ellie Myers with more than 10,000 yards of aggregate. We handled uh, the inch and a half stone for the pole settings, and a lot of the round rock stone for your entrances, and the crushed four inch stone. It was orders, it would be 15, 20 loads that we could split between a few trucks. Worked out great for us, give the employees more hours, a lot of overtime that they didn't expect. And it really helped everyone in the area. The town of Winterport received an unexpected windfall when Ellie Myers leased an old runway that was ideal for lattice tower assembly. 
came at a really great time because uh, as everyone knows revenues are down in the state of Maine and uh, it was unanticipated revenue which helped our tax taxpayers. MYR and Ellie Myers are extremely proud to be a part of the MPRP project. The aging infrastructure is something that needed to be addressed and I think Central Maine Power has done a, an awful lot for the state of Maine. Everybody has worked so well together that uh, this is a great model I think for people to look at. Yeah, it's just been a win-win for everybody. We've got hundreds of folks from New England, Maine, myself included, that have worked on the project. We've been able to live close to home, earn a great living, contribute to the economy, and protect Maine's environment. I've been out there since they've left, and it looks just like they've never been there. We're putting power in that enables this renewable energy to flow into our state and out of our state. So that makes me feel good that this construction is allowing for a cleaner future. So uh, again, that was a, a great project, and it wasn't just Ellie Myers. There was a, you know five other contractors out there working, but uh, what this had done for us and done for. I work with Eversource Utility, I work with uh, National Grid, I work with multiple ones, but as some of these projects such as Northern Pass, a few of the other ones where they're trying to get through the, uh, either the, the, like New Hampshire's, the SEC, uh, all the, as I call them, nuts in the State House. I mean, it was nice, we had set up a, something similar like we are here today with state reps and senators and brought those people, not only the workers that worked on that project in Maine, but the small business owner and they actually told their story. Where some people think, you know, they want to build these projects. It's just, a, you know, uh, as in years past, I mean, I've, I've been in the trade for a long time I and mean, I've worked all over the country and I always kind of felt bad that I was working in Michigan knowing there was probably people that could, you know, do the job I was doing but didn't have the proper training. So, but through all this, we came up with a commitment on Northern Pass was the first one and we're looking to do it elsewhere. Is we're making a commitment to New Hampshire workers first. So, uh, as I think Kate, Caitlin had mentioned about our, I mean, our numbers are going down big time. I mean, through retirement, maybe close to 50 or 52% or in the next 10 years we'll lose. So we're trying to replace those as quickly as possible. But again, like you said, the experience is, is one thing you really need. But what these transmission projects, especially the new ones do, where there's no energized conductors or anything like that, we can, we can, where usually it's, one apprentice to one journeyman, we can go three apprentices to a journeyman and get them at least the basic, the climbing, uh, working on transmission. So it's a, uh, we have a long road to hoe, but we're willing to do it. And we're partnering together with the utilities in other things such as, uh, we have a community college in New Hampshire that uh, Eversource, the IBW, and the Contractors Association have partnered up with the college to ensure that we, again, take the ones we're running it. There's many line colleges around the country right now where you can just apply and you get in and you decide halfway through the program that it's not for you. Well, your parents or, who, or yourself have you lost money. We're ensuring, we're putting them through a, like a small boot camp before the college will even accept them. So we're trying our best to make sure that we have a reliable workforce and a local workforce. So and that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, while talking about uh, grid security and, and transmission planning over the next 20, 30 years uh, and renewable energy and bulk power markets, it's important we get a dose of the real world once in a while. And, and uh, Tyler, I thank you for that. Thank the uh, IBEW for sending, us our, uh, sending you our way. Um, we have time for some, do we have, we have time for some questions? Chrissy? 
Hi there, Christy Tizak from Clearview Energy Partners, and this is for anyone on the panel. Um, one of the things that shifted in the pipeline industry was a move away from building new infrastructure based on what, you know, exclusively funded by the consumer um, end user through rates. So the, a lot of the pipeline infrastructure was built by um, to meet the needs of the local gas distribution companies who then recovered it over time in their rates, not unlike utilities um, recover transmission investments in their rates to retail ratepayers. Um, now we are seeing uh, more interest from the producers in the gas fields interested in taking um, their product to market, also participating in trying to help fill that gap of um, getting the pipeline built maybe a little bit earlier than right when it's needed. Um, do you see any opportunity for a discussion in a, of that sort of rate structure on the electric side so that generation that's remote um, may, you know, sort of find a way to, you know, because we talk a lot about incentives and I can think of a pretty big investment tax credit, I can think of a production tax credit, and so the question is, is there a way to sort of equilibrate and sort of help bridge the gap um, by getting the generators involved the way producers have become more involved on the pipeline side? Oh, I'll start. Uh, yeah, uh, good good point. A couple thoughts for the electric sector. First of all, with these merchant DC lines, those are largely funded by capacity reservations from uh, either generators or their off-taker, so between the two. So it's much more pipeline-like, which you can do with DC because you can control who's on and off that, that line. Uh, and we are seeing a lot more of those merchant DC lines around the country. Um, that's one. And then uh, generally talking about uh, incentives uh, for transmission if there's some federal incentive to sort of upsize or right size some of these lines uh, I think you can always or should always uh, make sure that there's enough skin in the game from the market that there's enough reservations from private parties uh, to show that you know this is a you know this is a useful line that was uh, sort of the framework that was used in the uh, Tehachapi transmission the uh, CREZ also had some skin in the game requirements in in Texas um, and uh, I think there were some others but uh, you know whether that's ultimately funded through a tariff um, through the regulatory approach or through some kind of federal incentive I think you can uh, basically upsize or fill the gap uh, in the lines, but it, I think it's good public policy to make sure there's enough, you know, private demonstration of interest where people were, are putting their own capital at risk uh, to show a certain portion of the line uh, is reserved and paid for. Others? No. Uh, I'll just, I'll, uh, I think uh, Rob makes a good point about merchant. The other thing um, I'll talk about a little bit is, um, the, on the electric side, um, the one place where the, the generator does pay is on the interconnection side. So when there's an interconnection of a new resource, um, the, the generator is paying for the upgrades to the system to get on, on board. Uh, when we did our interconnection reform um, technical conference last March, or I guess it was last May, um, one discussion we had was the degree to which you could marry up the transmission planning process and the interconnection process uh, in a way that would make both of them a little bit more efficient. Um, I, I think I sensed during that conference a certain interest in folks to explore that issue further. Um, I think what people talked about was that, that the, the, the thing that will make that a little hard is the cost allocation element because right now we have this very clear generators pay on the interconnection side, load pays on the transmission side, um, that you'll have to reconcile um, how costs shift, whether a, there is a cost shift or how those costs are changing, that cost assignment will change. Um, but, uh, you know, again, I think once we've got a couple commissioners, we'll have a sense of whether those couple commissioners are interested in, in that. But I think that idea of marrying up interconnection and transmission planning is out there. Uh, I guess yeah. I've, uh, I'm a bit of a perspective from this, the view of, of uh, bringing generation to market. And in the case of the uh, Great Northern Transmission Line, essentially it's a, it's a generator interconnection almost for new generation in Canada. However, when generation connection is transmission, the difficulty is that the, the producer is paying for the line and Manitoba Hydro is a substantial, it pays 100% of the, of the line in Canada, a substantial portion of the share in the, in the U.S. Um, 
How, however, if uh, that now transmission is regional transmission, it provides all kinds of uh, reliability benefits that you don't get with a typical lower voltage generator interconnection. So there's benefits that flow to the, the broader market. And MISO study between half a billion and a billion dollars a year uh, flows through to customers. But none of that comes back to the generator. So th that there's quite a difficulty in that scenario. Also, uh, MISO's uh, value uh, way of valuing multi-value economic projects essentially stops at the border. It, it takes into account production costs from existing generators. It doesn't take into production savings from generators that could be built in the future. So there are discontinuities uh, when you are actually trying to apply um, cost allocation to, to make everyone happy. Currently, one of our concerns is not are there proper incentives, but to what extent are there going to be disincentives with respect to energy storage? With energy, with whenever you move energy on the transmission system, locational marginal prices are a very effective way of saying here is a here is a barrier that you should respect and try and move energy around. And in order to accomplish that, they they charge marginal losses. Marginal losses are double the cost of real losses. So that signal that's saying don't produce too much because incrementally you are you are causing this this load, that that produces a net cash flow which essentially the company uh, the RTO like MISO takes and gives to someone else. Now consider yourself as energy storage. The system has too much energy. You want to get rid of it. So energy storage takes that to the extent that it creates marginal losses. You pay a premium for those for those losses. You pay a tax on taking energy out of the system. Then when the system wants the energy, you put it back. You're charged a tax again for putting the energy back into the system. And then MISO takes that and gives that to somebody else. So uh, I think energy storage uh, faces some disincentives. And this issue has been brought up before FERC. And FERC's first response was, let's keep it simple. Let's just call them a megawatt hour, a megawatt hour. The price is always the same. And that, that, there is some logic to that. However, there still exists this issue that not only in some cases are you missing uh, incentives, in some cases you're creating disincentives. Okay, this, this panel is, uh, is a bunch of appetizers because uh, um, each subject matter that we've been talking about would be worthy of, you know, a half-day conversation. So uh, that's, that's uh, our fault for trying to cram a lot in there. But I'm going to take one more question. I hope it's really a good one from somebody. And then we're going to break for lunch. Um, questions? Question, questions? Well, well, let. So let I me. have a, I have a oh. question. Oh, I'm sorry, well, this okay. is a geeky transmission question, and it might not appeal to everybody. Um, I have a question about the lack of investment in the AC system, and so in theory, when we were designing the nodal markets, it should have been the price splits that got the cost differentials that someone would want to build to move those cost differentials back in line, but they got the property rights. They got to do the delivery, and so that was, in theory, how you funded these forward was through the auction revenue rights or financial transmission rights. However, when you look at the planning paradigm, you're trying to plan for reliability first and foremost, and sometimes the economic signals aren't strong if you're taking those away, um, economic splits are often an early indicator of a, a reliability problem about to come up. So is it the interaction of the economic signals, the reliability signals, that, that it just puts too much uncertainty into the price splits and the original design of saying you would buy forward congestion relief um, is just not holding together because there's so many influencing factors in the planning process that, that introduce a lot of risk? So I think, I think the difficulty is um, the way that merchant model was supposed to work for the AC system was someone built that line and what, what they got as a result, because it's a financial market, um, uh, what they got was a, the right to the congestion charges across that line. Um, so 
uh, the, just the math of how electricity markets work. Um, from the high price, the, the high price area ends up collectively paying more than the low price generators typically get paid. There's a chunk of money left over. That chunk of money has to be distributed to people. It's distributed through these financial, these financial transmission rights. I think that the difficulty thing with transmission investment is if you've identified that place where there's this persistent price difference, um, if you build a line that's big enough to completely collapse the price difference, there are no more congestion rents after the line is built. So you have the right to collect, but there's nothing left over. So then the incentive is to only build the project big enough that it still makes sense but you keep some congestion left over on the system. Um, and, and that's not a great planning model. Um, so I think that's, that has been the difficulty, um, is that the value is destroyed by the investment. And so there's, there's got to be another, another vehicle. The, the people who are getting the benefit out of that are the, the, the customers at the end who used to pay a lot and now are paying less. Um, and you've got to find a way to encourage those customers to be willing to pay for the cost of that line. I'll, I'll add a, a little bit. I agree with that. Uh, and just to wonk out a little bit deeper, your friend and mine, Bill Hogan, and, and others would say, <laughs> uh, well, but, uh, you know, you could have the, uh, you know, high, the customers on the high side of the congestion, uh, uh, you know, contract long term for those, uh, you know, with that, with that developer because in the long run they're going to be paying that high congestion costs and so there's some incentive. There is room for a deal, in other words, for a market-based solution in that case. Um, but when I was, uh, I know, advising uh, for Chairman Wood and other commissioners in the early 2000s and uh, approving these early RTO filings, um, it w you know, we had these debates with uh, Paul Jaskows and Bill Hogan's and others about how much do you rely on the market versus uh, regulatory planning for transmission. And uh, Bill, if he were here, I think would acknowledge that even in the pure LMP market-based model, uh, the optimum amount of transmission is not built. There are market failures uh, in, in transmission. There's, in fact, just about every market failure there is, is in transmission. Uh, yeah. And you can't fully define all the property rights as public goods, uh, so it, it's going to underbuild. The market alone is going to underbuild the grid. Uh, and so uh, for that reason, um, as well as I would say there were some other reasons such as the uh, added complexity you get in markets when you're trying to have understandable markets for consumers, you know, after the California experience and others when, when, you know, congestion can create all sorts of opportunities for manipulation and consumer confusion about what's going on, um, uh, as well as uh, just the, uh, you know, a accessing uh, remote resources. Uh, gave us reason at that time to say uh, don't rely on the market alone, include uh, economic planning uh, as well. In fact, FERC rejected PJM's initial RTO application because it did not have economic planning. Uh, so PJM had to come back and say here's our economic planning, we'll look at benefits compared to costs, we'll build a line. Uh, of course, they've implemented that uh, based on stakeholder input in a way that you can almost never pass the benefit cost test. Uh, mm -hmm. So we, we ultimately lost that, that one. But uh, that would be my answer is that just it's not efficient to rely on the market alone, even in an LMP framework, so you need to do more. And perhaps one, uh, you know, one thing we should think about here when you, when you can say when you do the right thing in transmission, it doesn't make economic sense, that you need something else to, to come in and get things straight. And in, this, in the case of a vertically integrated utility, someone can make an investment and they reaped it all because it was the, whatever the, whether that benefit was economic or reliability or uh, in, uh, added cheaper maintenance or, or whatever they they captured it all now that that doesn't happen so how, how do you, how do you get back to that is what we're trying to do but with this experience let's look at where we're going with energy storage and look at the invest look at Luddington we don't have pump storage but I always look at a plant like that at, at uh, DTE, DTE as an amazing um, uh, an amazing uh, plant. It was the largest in the world. These are the largest machines in the world. They are larger than the engines that drive your uh, aircraft, uh, your uh, aircraft carrier at full speed. Uh, and 
they, they were built, when they were built, they, could, they were valuable because they moved energy, cheap energy, from the night to onto peak, and they, they survived on the on off peak differential. That plant is worth a billion dollars. However, the current market will destroy the on off peak differential because solar will reduce the price during the day, gas will reduce the, that, that price, wind is blowing at night. The, the, the on off peak differential is destroyed. So as you get more and more wind and solar, you need more and more Luddingtons. As you get more and more wind and solar, you destroy the market economics that make Luddington possible. So uh, we have an, in, we, if you look back at the problem we've had with transmission, looking forward, you're going to have exactly the same problem with energy storage, and I think it's going to be worse. Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, on that optimistic note, <laughs> um, let me let, let me uh, 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 ask you to uh, go get your lunch. It's right outside. Uh, let me ask you to, to bring it back because we have a, a Congressman uh, Wahlberg is going to be here in probably five or ten minutes, and um, and I think you'll want to hear from him. Uh, so uh, join me in, in thanking this fabulous panel for their hard work. <laughs> <laughs>